Good evening. For me, bikes are fun, and I think that's true for most of us. However, whoops, we, we really skipped through that one. There we go. This, this boy in Southern Africa thinks it's a lot of fun, and he's having a great time. However, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than five million people earn a living through the use of a bike. This gentleman's in Madagascar, and obviously, you know, he, he markets uh, these textiles. He makes multiple trips a day, and this is the basis for, for earning a living. People travel long distances, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, many parts of Asia, and the bicycle is four times faster and allows you to carry four times more things. Still, the problem is that these bicycles are expensive relative to people's income. This is a typical Chinese-made Phoenix bike. Um, it's cost about 80 to 90 dollars in Africa, which is far beyond the capacity of many rural people to afford. So yes, people can, can buy it, but number one, even though it's cost more than what they can afford, it's also very cheaply made. It's uh, very heavy, clunky, um, breaks down, the tires uh, will wear out quickly, the tubes will pop, typically within 25 miles. It's, it's a piece of junk. <laughs> so, many people continue to do walking. Head loading is a, a major phenomenon in, in parts of Africa and other third world countries, in rural areas. Here are some small farmers and they're walking to market to sell their products. If they had a bicycle, they could become a lot more productive. Back in the United States, here's a, a graph, whoops, sorry, a graph of new bike and car sales. We purchase something like 16 million bicycles every year, about the same number as the number of cars and light trucks. So imagine that, you know, here in the United States we have lots of bikes, over in Africa, not so many. What do we do with the bikes? They collect dust uh, in people's storage units. Uh, they get repurposed for other uses. They get thrown out. Driving up here today on Route 15, I don't know if, uh, if you've done the Route 15 bypass, but there's a pottery place that, that has about 20 bicycles with signs all the way along Route 15. So those, those have been repurposed, but they're, they're totally rusted and no good but we have a lot of bikes and they're very, very freely available. There are a number of organizations that have seen that juxtaposition. Bicycles here that are available, the need for bicycles for productive purposes, to get people to work, to help people do work, to get young people to school. Um, typically in, in, in many parts of the developing world, uh, there'll be students who will attend a school in their community village level primary school, and they graduate from that primary school, and what happens? The regional high school is 10 miles down the road, and they drop out. And that's particularly acute for uh, young girls uh, for many reasons, um, safety, other things, you don't, uh, you drop out, cultural pressures and the like. Bikes for the World is one of half a dozen organizations in the United States that has started to collect bikes to figure out a business model for collecting thousands of bicycles and to get them to other countries where they can provide um, valuable assistance. The way that we do it is not go around picking up bikes. It just wouldn't be feasible. Uh, it, it just doesn't pay. Uh, when I started out, I spent uh, uh, one cold winter night driving from house to house, picking up bikes. And I said, this is crazy, this is crazy. Uh, so what we found is that if we reach out to community service organizations, churches, synagogues, other faith communities, schools, uh, universities, rotary and other service clubs, and make the collection of bikes a community service effort, uh, that this is a way that we can get many, many bikes. What the community organizations will do, they're looking for community service opportunities that will be fun and entertaining for their members, that will teach them something, 
will give them a feeling of satisfaction from, uh, for, for environmental or humanitarian reasons. And a bike collection, which they advertise in their community, and uh, uh, for, a, for a certain time, typically a Saturday morning, and if, if you put that out to the community, you can get 50, 100, 200 bikes donated in the space of a few hours. This community is down in Hagerstown, Maryland. It's a church. They've done it for 10 years. They've averaged 200 bikes each time they've done it. What they're, this is uh, somebody who is bringing a bike to donate, so that's how the bikes come. Sometimes they're ridden in, but more often than not, they're, they're, they're brought in by car. The volunteers will work on the bikes. We teach them, we provide tools and the, the knowledge and the, and the confidence to take the pedals off, to turn the handlebars, put the seats down, basically to make the bikes more compact for easy handling and eventually for shipment. Another aspect of it is that uh, we ask for a donation and we provide a receipt. Uh, what we found when we started out was that if we just asked for bikes, we'd get flooded with bikes, but then we wouldn't have the financial means to ship the bikes. Uh, it's, it's, it does take some money to do. And so what we decided to do, and not out of any great strategic vision, but out of desperation, we asked for five or ten dollars donation uh, contribution from each of the donors. And if we put the word out ahead of time, and if we asked nicely, and if we gave them a tax receipt, we often got it. And that was the first step toward expanding the program, making it sustainable, and, and building up scale. What do we do with the bikes afterwards? Once you do a collection, you got to get them someplace. Uh, you normally don't get enough bikes at a collection to be able to ship them immediately. So we often have volunteers with pickup trucks. Um, we also We'll rent a truck and load the, and uh, now the bikes are all uh, processed, they're all flattened. That's a 26 foot truck, we can typically get over 200 bikes into it. There we go back at our storage area. This is in Northern Virginia. Um, this is in the spring uh, when people are doing spring cleaning. And as you can see, there are quite a few bikes. Uh, if, you, if you look closely, those are, those are bikes. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I'd say there's probably about 3,000 bicycles there, um, and that was a particularly uh, overwhelming couple of weeks. Um, while we're there, we sort the bikes by type and size, uh, and that's done by volunteers, again, and people learn about bikes, they learn how to work with bikes, it's uh, unpressured, it's a lot of fun, and it's a very rewarding community service. Uh, experience and here we have somebody who is stripping useful parts from marginal bikes that will scrap. It's really important that we don't ship junk. Uh, they, the bikes have to be not only in repairable or better condition, they also have to be the type of bikes that they want in a particular environment. So for example, if we're supplying a, a, a rural project, a dirt road project as we, as we say, then it's going to be a mountain bike, a wide tire bike. If it's in uh, an urban area with pavement, like our, our relationship with Goodwill Panama in Panama City, we can send them more road bikes. And if it's a kid's project, obviously we can give them uh, smaller kids' bikes. Then we load them into a shipping container. Uh, this is a 40-foot shipping container. Uh, there's a real art and a science of fitting the bikes in, depending on how, how good we feel that day and how many kids' bikes, we can fit around 500 bikes into a 40-foot shipping container, one of those containers that you see going down the road heading for the port of Baltimore. Once overseas, they unload it. Sometimes they have a loading dock, sometimes they don't. This is, a, this is um, arriving from Madagascar, and uh, they're opening up, and that's, hopefully nobody uh, is in the way when they fall out. <laughs> the next step is to recondition the bikes. You notice that when I talked earlier, when I mentioned earlier, we select the bikes, we strip marginal bikes for useful parts, we prep the bikes, we flatten them, 
but we really don't do a lot of repair work. The important thing here is that if you have good labor, good mechanics overseas, that's a good uh, labor, uh, a good um, job in a labor surplus economy. And so part of the impact of this program is to provide opportunities to service bikes and earn a living for skilled mechanics. This one also happens to be in Madagascar, and a distinguishing characteristic of this is that uh, that that container has been converted, been retained there, and converted into a bike shop, sort of a bike shop in a box. Let's see. There we go. Now we're in the Village Bicycle Project in Ghana. Village Bicycle Project. Uh, works with the Peace Corps to sell bikes on a concessional basis in rural Ghana in order to extend the market to productive people uh, in the outskirts uh, of, of the country. And because people aren't always familiar with uh, having owned a bike before, it, they have to learn to maintain them. And so the way the Village Bicycle Project works is to do a workshop, a weekend workshop, uh, for the individual getting the bike. The person has to pay a very modest price uh, at the end of the <coughs> workshop, once they've learned to maintain the bike. If they want, they can acquire tools in order to maintain the bike, paying about half the cost. Uh, the philosophy is that people should be invested. Uh, you don't want to just give away things uh, because then, you know, will they use the tools? Or if they get a free bike, would it just turn around and get a windfall, windfall profit um, by selling it to somebody else? This gentleman, also um, in Ghana, is going out to his farm. It's several miles out of town where he lives. He has several plots, and he's carrying water. He also will carry um, water and, and fertilizer, mix it and spray it. So this is something, remember I said that you can go four times faster and you can carry four times more. And here's an example that this guy can produce more. This is another gentleman. This is in an urban area. Uh, we work with a microcredit program in Costa Rica. And that microcredit program loaned this gentleman, his name is Marco Benicio, and he got a loan of $10 to purchase this bike. And his employment was to market, to sell, uh, uh, snacks to workers in construction sites around the city of San Jose. And before, he was walking from construction site to construction site. Um, and you can imagine how much time that consumed in order to sell a very small quantity of, of goods. With the bike, he was able to carry more, carry some uh, cold uh, ice pops, and he was able to move more quickly from site to site and he dramatically increased his income, and he was able to pay off the loan within a couple of weeks. And ever since then, everything else has gone to his family and to raising the standard of living. The microcredit program in Costa Rica, they will pay us for the shipping, and they will then provide the bikes um, at a discounted price, far below, below the market, but still charging something so that they are able to cover their cost. That allows us to focus on our cost here and to expand the program and pick up more and more bikes. The title of, what I, of, of this presentation is Changing Lives One, one Bike at a Time. And, uh, but the key thing is to be able to, to be able to expand it, to change more and more lives. And each, each bike that we get um, passes through many hands. It passes through the hands of the volunteers uh, here, and they learn skills. They, they get the satisfaction of putting uh, the bike to good use. We've worked with uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, who learn something. A lot of Boy Scouts will get their Eagle Community Service Project requirements satisfied. Um, we've done bar mitzvahs. Um, there's a lot of benefit here through handling the bike. Then the bike goes overseas, it gets uh, reconditioned, so that generates employment there, and then the bike gets to the ultimate beneficiary. 
It all goes also through an organization. We partner with nonprofit organizations. And by providing them this capital, we strengthen their administrative abilities and their financial abilities as well. So when I say that a bike can change lives, that we're changing lives one bike at a time, it's in, you know, each bike impacts different, uh, different uh, people. Uh, this individual, just one more story before we close up, is a woman who got out of jail. Um, she was supported by the Women Prisoner Support Organization in Kampala, Uganda. And she needed to support her four kids. She'd been abandoned by her husband uh, um, while, during the time she was in jail. She got out, she didn't have anything. They got her a job marketing bottled water to, uh, to stores in the outskirts of Kampala. And she was paying a taxi driver to carry her from store to store to deliver the water. And that took a lot of the, the profit. With a loan, she got that bike that you can barely see, and she's able to carry a lot more and keep a lot more of, uh, of the benefit. Last year, or actually in November 2014, Bikes for the World celebrated its 100,000th bike. Uh, we have now reached 114,000 bikes uh, shipped. We also have handled bikes uh, for other organizations around the country. Uh, we work with a group in Chicago. We work with a group in St. Louis. We work with a group in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, we now just opened uh, our own satellite uh, volunteer network in New York and in Charleston. And in New York, we shipped our first container back in October of this year, of last year. So we're trying to foster a network of programs that collaborate and that can make this help not just 100,000 people, but 200, 300, and 400,000 people because there are a lot of bikes sitting around going to waste. So when I talk about changing lives one bike at a time, this is what we're talking about. Thank you very much.